Hey guys, it's Maddie. Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the most famous mass suicide, which is the Jonestown mass suicide. Um, if you want to see all about this thing, just continue watching. So the People's Temple, which is also known as Jonestown, was a settlement established by um, with the People's Temple, which is a cult under the leadership of Jim Jones in Guyana, Esquiba. Don't know how to pronounce that. Um, it's a territory in northwestern Guyana claimed by Venezuela. It became internationally known when on November 18th, 1978, a total of 918 people died at the settlement at the nearby airstrip. In Port Ketuma and at a temple-run building in Georgetown, Guyana's capital city, the name of the settlement became syn synonymous synonymous with the incidents at those locations. In total, 909 individuals died in Jonestown, all but two from apparent cyanide poisoning in an event termed revolutionary suicide by Jones and some People's Temple members on an audio tape of the event and in prior recorded discussions. The poisonings in Jonestown followed the murder of five others by Temple members at Port Katuma, including United States Congressman Leo Ryan, an act that Jones ordered. Four other Temple members committed mass suicide in Georgetown at Jones' command. The terms used to describe the deaths in jo Jonestown and Georgetown evolved over time. Many contemporary media accounts after the events called the deaths a mass suicide. In contrast, most sources today refer to the deaths with terms such as mass murder-suicide, massacre, um, or simply just mass murder. Seventy or more individuals at Jonestown were injected with poison, and a third of the victims were minors. Uh, guards armed with guns and crossbows had been ordered to shoot those who fled the Jonestown Pavilion as Jones lobbied for suicide. Jonestown resulted in the largest single loss of American civil civilian life in a deliberate act until 9-11. So the People's Temples uh, was found in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1955. F uh, though its roots and teachings shared more with the biblical church, and Christian revival movements than with Marxism. It um, practiced what it was called as a apostolic socialism. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. But in doing so, the temple preached that those who remained drugged with the opiate of religion had to be brought to enlightenment socialism. In the early 1960s, Joan visited Guyana, then a British colony, while on his way to establishing a short-lived temple mission in Brazil. After Jones received considerable criticism in Indiana for his views, the temple moved to Redwood Valley, California in 1965. In the early 1970s, the temple opened other branches in Los Angeles and San Francisco and would eventually move its headquarters to Fran San Francisco. With the move to San Francisco came increasing political involvement by the temple and the high levels of approval they received from their local government. Um, after the group's participation proved uh, to the mayor election of George Moscone in 1975, Moscone appointed Jones as a chairman of the San Francisco Housing Authority Commission. Unlike many other figures who are considered cult leaders, Jones enjoyed public support and contact with some of the highest level politicians in the United States. Jones met with vice presidential candidate Walter Mondale and the first lady Rosalind Carter. Guests at a large 1976 testimonial dinner for Jones included California Governor Jerry Brown, Lieutenant Governor Mervyn Dimali, Dime and the California Assemblyman Willie Brown, among others. In the fall of 1973, after critical newspaper articles by Lester Kinsolving and the defection of eight temple, eight temple members, Jones and Temple attorney Tim Stone prepared an in, immediate action, contin oh my gosh, I cannot talk today, contingency plan for responding to a police or media crackdown. The plan listed various options, including fleeing to Canada or to a Caribbean missionary post, such as Barbados or Trinidad. For its Caribbean missionary post, the temple quickly chose Guyana conducting research on its economy and extradition treaties with the U.S. 
In October 1973, the director of the temple passed a resolution to establish an agricultural mission there to Guyana. The temple chose Guyana in part because of the group's own social po uh, socialist politics, which were moving further to the left during the selection process. Former temple member Tim Carter stated that the reasons for choosing Guyana were the temple's views of a perceived dominance of racism and multinational corporations in the U.S. government. According to Carter, the temple concluded that Guyana, an English-speaking socialist country with a predominantly in indigenous population and with a government including prominent Black leaders, would afford Black temple members a peaceful place to live. Later, Guyana's uh, Prime Minister Forbes Burnham stated that Jones may have wanted to use co cooperative as a basis for the establishment of socialism and maybe his idea of setting up a commune meshed with that. Jones also thought that Guyana was a small, poor, and independent enough for him to easily obtain influence and official protection. Jones was so skillful in presenting the Guyanese government the benefits of allowing the People's Temple Agricultural Project to settle within its borders. One of the main tactics was to speak of the advantages that their American presence near the Guyanese border of Venezuela. This idea seemed promising to the People's National Con Congress who feared attack from Venezuela. In 1974, after traveling to an area of northwestern Guyana with Guyanese officials, Jones and the Temple negotiated, negotiated a lease of over 3,800 acres of land in the jungle located 150 miles west of the Guyanese capital of Georgetown. This, this site was isolated and had soil of low fertility even by Guyanese standards. Uh, the nearest body of water was seven miles away by muddy roads. Jones, Jonestown located, location stood not far from Guyana's uh, border with Venezuela and the Guyanese officials hoped that the presence of American citizens would deter a military invasion. As 500 members began the construction of Georgetown, I'm sorry, not Georgetown, Jonestown, the temple encouraged more to relocate the settlement. Jones saw Jonestown as both a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from media scrutiny. In 1976, Guyana finally approved the lease had negotiated with the temple for over 3,000 acres of land in northwest Guyana on which Jonestown was located. In 1974, Guyanese officials granted the temple permission to import certain items duty-free. Later payoffs helped safeguard shipments of firearms and drugs through Guyanese customs. Jones reached an agreement to guarantee that Guyana would permit temple's me temple members mass migration. To do so, he stated that they were skilled and progressive, showed off an envelope he claimed contained $500,000, and stated that he would invest most of the group's assets in Guyana. The re re oh my god, I cannot talk today. The relatively large number of immigrants to Guyana overwhelmed the government's small but stringent immigration infrastructure in a country where immigrants had outweighed locals. Guyanese immigration procedures were compromised to inhibit the departure of temples, defectors, and uh, the visas of temple opponents. Jonestown was held up as a, a communist community with Jones stating, I believe we're the purest communists there are. Jones' wife, Marceline, Marceline, I don't know how to pronounce her name, described Jonestown as dedicated to live for socialism, total economic and racial and social e equality. We are here living communally. Jones wanted to construct a model community and claimed that Burnham couldn't rave enough about us, the wonderful things we do, the project, the model of socialism. Jones did not permit members to leave Jonestown without his um, permission. The temple established offices in Georgetown and conducted numerous meetings with Burnham and other Guyanese officials. In 1976, Temple member Michael Porks requested that Burnham receive Jones as a foreign um, dignitary along with other high-ranking U.S. officials. Jones traveled to Guyana with Dimali to meet with Burnham and Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Willis. In that meeting, Dimali agreed to pass on the message to the State Department that Socialist Guyana wanted to keep an open door to cooperation with the U.S. Dimali followed up that meeting with a large, not with a large, <laughs> with a letter to Burnham stating that Jones was one of the most finest human beings and that Dimali 
was tremendously impressed by his visit to Jonestown. Temple members took pains to stress their loyalty to Burnham's People National Congress Party. One Temple member, Paula Adams, was involved in a romantic relationship with Guyana's ambassador to the U.S., Lawrence Mann. Jones bragged about other female Temple members he referred to as public relation women, giving all the causes in Jonestown. Viola Burnham, the wife of the Prime Minister, was also long also a strong advocate of the temple. Later, Burnham stated that Guyana allowed the temple to operate in the manner it did on the reference of Moscone, Mandalay, and Rosalind Carter. Burnham also said that when Deputy, Deputy Minister Patalmi Reed traveled to Washington, D.C. in September 1977 to sign the Panama Canal Treaties, Mondale asked him, how's Jim? Which indicated to Reed that Mondale had a personal interest in Joan's well-being. In the summer of 1977, Jones and several hundred Temple members moved to Jonestown to escape building pressure from San, San Francisco media investigations. Jones left the same night that the editor at New West Magazine read him an article to be published by Marshall Klidoff detailing allegations of abuse by former Temple members. After the mass migration, Jonestown became overcrowded. Jonestown population was slightly under 900 at as its peak in 1978. For the first several months, Temple members worked six days a week from approximately 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. with an hour for lunch. In mid-1978, after Jones' health deteriorated and his wife began managing more of Jonestown operations, the work week was reduced to eight hours a day for five days a week. After the day's work ended, Temple members would attend several hours of activities in the pavilion, including classes in socialism. Jones compared this schedule to the North Korean system of eight hours of daily work followed by eight hours of study. This also comported with the Temple's practice of gradually subjecting its followers to sophisticated mind control and behavior modification techniques borrowed from North Korea and China. Jones would often read news and commentary, including items from Radio Moscow and Radio Havana, and was known to the side with Soviets over the Chinese during the, the Sino-Soviet uh, split, however you would say that. Discussion around current events often took the forms of Jones interrogating individual followers about the implications and subtexts of the given news item or delivering lengthy and often confused monologues on how to read certain events. In addition to Soviet document documentaries, political thrillers such as The Parallax View, The Day of the Jackal, State of Siege, and Z were reportedly screened and minutely analyzed by Jones. Recordings of commune meetings show how livid and frustrated Jones would get when anyone did not find the films interesting or did not understand the message that Jones was placing upon them. Nothing in the way of film or recorded TV, no matter how people saw it, um, could be viewed without a temple staffer present to interpret the material of the viewers. This meant uh, that damning criticisms of perceived capitalist propaganda in Western material and glowing phrase praise for and highlighting the Marxists and the Leninists messages in the material from communist nations. Jones recorded readings of the news were part of the constant broadcasts over George Jonestown speakers such that all members could hear them throughout the day and night. Jones' new readings usually portrayed the U.S. as a capitalist and imperialist villain while casting socialist leaders such as Kim, um, Kim Young, Robert Mogabe, and Joseph Stalin in a positive light. Jones made frequent addresses to Temple members regarding Jonestown's safety, including statements that the CIA and other intelligence agencies were con conspir conspiring with capitalist pigs to destroy the settlement and harm its people. After work, when emergencies arose, the temple sometimes conducted what Jones would refer to as white nights. During such events, Jones would sometimes give the Jonestown members four options to attempt to flee to the Soviet Union, commit revolutionary suicide, stay in Jonestown and fight the attackers or flee into the jungle. Jones was known to study Adolf Hitler and Father Divine to learn how to manipulate members of the cult. Divine told Jones personally to find an enemy and to make sure they know who the enemy is, as it will unify those in the group and make them submit to them. 
In late 1977 and early 1978, Tim and Grace Stone participated in meetings with other relatives of Jonestown residents at the home of Jeannie Mills, another Temple member. Together, they called themselves the Concerned Relatives. Tim Stone engaged in letter writing campaigns to the U.S. Secretary of State and the Guyanese government and traveled to Washington, D.C. to attempt to begin an investigation. In January 1978, Stone wrote a white paper to Congress detailing his grievances and requesting that Congressman write to Prime Minister Burnham. 91 congressmen wrote such letters, including Congressman Leo Ryan. On February 17, 1978, Jones submitted to an interview with San Francisco Examiner reporter Tim Reederman. Reederman's subsequent story about the Stone custody battle prompted the immediate threat of a lawsuit by the Temple. The repercussions were devastating for the Temple's reputation and made most former supporters more suspicious of the Temple's claim that it would be a victim of righteous vendetta. Still, others remained loyal. On the day after Readerman's article was published, Harvey Milk, which is a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, who was supported by the Temple, wrote a letter to President Jimmy Carter defending Jones as a man of the highest character and stating that the Temple's defectors were trying to damage Jones' reputation with apparent bold-faced lies. Jones' health really declined in Jonestown. In 1978, Jones was informed of a possible lung infection, which he announced to his followers that he had lung cancer, which is, a, which is a ploy to get them to sympathize with him, and he wanted to strengthen the support within the community. Jones was said to be abusing um, Valium, stimulants, and barbiturates. Audio tapes of 1978 meetings with Jonestown attest to Jones' declining physical condition with the commune leader complaining of high blood pressure, small strokes, weight loss of 21 to 30 pounds in the last two weeks of Jonestown, temporary blindness, convulsions, and in early 1978 in November, while he was ill in his cabin, grotesque swelling of the extrem extremities. John, not John, <laughs> Jones often mentioned chronic insomnia. He would often say he went f like for three to four days without any sleep. During meetings and public addresses, his once sharp speaking voice sounded slurred, words ran together and were like tripped over. Jones would occasionally not even finish his sentences when reading typed reports over the commune's uh, PA system. Reederman was surprised by the severe deterioration of Jones' health when he saw him in Jonestown on 19, November 17, 1978. After covering Jones for 18 months for the examiner, Reederman thought it was shocking to see his glazed eyes and festering paranoia face to face to realize that nearly a thousand lives, ours included, were in his hands. Leo Ryan, who represented California's 11th Congregational District, announced that he would visit Jonestown. Ryan was friends with the father of Bob Houston, a Temple member in California whose mutilated body was found near their tracks on October 5th, 1976, three days after a taped telephone conversation with Houston's ex-wife in which leading the Temple was discussed. Over the following months, Ryan's interest was further aroused by the allegations put forth by Stone, Layton, and the concerned relatives. On November 14th, Ryan flew to Jonestown along with a delegation that included Jackie Spear, Ryan's then legal advisor, Neville Anaborn, representing Guyana's Ministry of Information, Richard Dwyer, which is a deputy chief of the mission of the U.S. Embassy to Guyana, San Francisco examiner reporter Tim Reederman, examiner photographer Greg Robinson, NBC reporter Don Harris, NBC camera operator Bob Brown, NBC audio technician Steve Song, and NBC producer Bob Flick, Washington Post reporter Charles Krause, San Francisco Chronicle reporter Ron uh, Javers, and concerned relatives representatives including Tim and Grace Stone, Steve and Anthony Katsaris, Beverly Oliver, Jim, Jim Cobb, Sharon Harris, and Carolyn Houston. Boyd. When the Ryan delegation arrived in Guyana, Lane and Gary initially refused to allow them access to Jonestown. However, by the morning of November 17th, they informed Jones that Ryan would likely leave for Jonestown that afternoon, regardless of his willingness. Ryan's party, accompanied by Lane and Gary, came to an airstrip at Port Katuma, six miles from Jonestown, some hours later. Because of the aircraft seating limitations, only four of the concerned relatives were allowed to accompany the delegation on its flight into Jonestown. 
Only Ryan and three others were initially accepted into Jonestown, while the rest of Ryan's group were allowed in after sunset. That night, they attended a musical reception in the settlement's main pavilion. While the party was received warmly, Jones said he felt like a dying man and ranted about government conspiracies as he decried attacks by the press and his enemies. It was later reported and verified by audio tapes recovered by investigators that Jones had run rehearsals on how to convince Ryan's delegation that everyone was happy and in good spirits. While most of the Ryan delegation began to depart on a large dump truck into the to the port uh Katuma airstrip, Ryan and Dwyer stayed behind in Jonestown to process any additional defectors. Shortly before the dump, dump truck left, Temple loyalist Larry Layton, the brother of Deborah Layton, demanded to join the group. Several defectors voiced their suspicions about Larry Layton's motives. Shortly after the dump truck initially departed, Temple member Don Sly grabbed Ryan while wielding a knife. While Ryan was unhurt after others wrestled Sly to the ground, Dwyer strongly suggested that the congressman leave Jonestown while he filed a com criminal complaint against Sly. Ryan did so, promising to return later to address a dispute. The truck departing to the airstrip had stopped after the passengers heard of the attack on Ryan and took him as a passenger before continuing its journey towards the airstrip. Before leaving Jonestown for the airstrip, Ryan told Gary that he would issue a report that would describe Jonestown in basically good terms. Ryan stated that none of the six relatives he had targeted for interviews wanted to leave. The 14 defectors uh, contin con con oh my gosh, con oh my gosh, constitute that's the word oh my god a very small portion of jonestown residents that any sense of imprisonment the defectors had were likely because of peer pressure and a lack of physical transportation and even if 200 of the 900 plus wanted to leave i'd still say you have a beautiful place here despite gary's report jones told him i have failed gary reiterated reiterated that ryan would be making a positive report but jones maintained that all is lost after Ryan's departure from Jonestown toward Port Katuma, Marceline Jones made a broadcast on the public address system stating that everything was right, all right and asking residents to return to their homes. During this time, aides prepared a large metal tub, tub with grape flavored poison with Valium, uh, cyanide and chloral hydrates and pentagram, don't know how to say that. About 30 minutes after Marceline Jones' announcement, Jim Jones made his own, calling all members immediately to the pavilion. A 44-minute cassette tape known as The Death Tape records part of the meeting Jones called inside the pavilion in the early evening of November 18, 1978. When the assembly gathered, referring to the Ryan delegation's air travel back to Georgetown, Jones told the gathering, in quote, one of those people on that plane is going to shoot the pilot. I know that. I didn't plan it, but I know it's going to happen. They're going to shoot that pilot and down comes the plane into the jungle and we had better not have any of our children left when it's over because they'll parachute in here on us, end quote. Parroting Jones' prior statement that hostile forces would convert captured children to face fascism, one Temple member stated, the ones that they took captured, they're going to just let them grow up and be dummies, end quote. On the tape, Jones urged Temple members to commit revolutionary suicide, such as an act had been planned by the Temple before and according to Jonestown defectors, its theory was, you can go down in history saying you chose your own way to go and it's your commitment to refuse capitalism and in support of socialism. The poison caused death within five minutes for children, less for babies, and an estimated 20 to 30 minutes for adults. After consuming the poison, according to Rhodes, people were escorted away from a wooden walkway leading outside the pavilion. It's not clear if some initially thought the exercise was another white night rehearsal. Rhodes reported being in close contact with dying children. In response to reactions of seeing the poison take effects on others, Jones counseled, Die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down the tears and agony. He also said, in quote, I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear. I don't care how many anguished cries. Death is a million times preferable to 10 days more of, of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, uh, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight, end quote. 
Rhodes described a scene of both hysteria and confusion as parents watched their children die from the poison. He also stated that most present quietly waited their own turn to die, and that many of the assembled temple members walked around like they were in a trance. This crowd was surrounded by armed guards offering members the basic dilemma of deaths by poison or death by a guard's hand. Cries and screams of children and adults were easily heard of the tape recording made. As more temple members died, eventually the guards themselves were called to die by poison. Jones was found dead lying next to his chair in the pavilion between two other bodies he had cushioned, his head cushioned by a pillow. His death was caused by a gunshot wound to his right temple that Guyanese chief medical examiner Leslie Mutu stated was consistent with being self-inflicted. The events at Georgetown con constituted the greatest single loss of American civil civilian life before 9-11. Three high-ranking temple members survived, claimed they were given an assignment, and therefore escaped death. Tim Carter and his brother Mike, aged 30 and 20, and Mike Prokes, 31, were given luggage containing $550,000 currency, or in the U.S., currency, 130000 in Guyanese currency, and an envelope which they were told to deliver to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown. The envelope contained two passports and three instructional letters, the first of which was stating, quote, Dear Comrade Timo Fife, the following is a letter of instructions regarding to all of our assets that we want to leave to the Communist Party of the Union of Social Soviet Socialist Republics. Enclosed in this letter are letters in which instruct the banks to send the cashier's checks to you. I am doing this on behalf of People's Temples because we, as communists, want our money to be of benefit or help to oppressed peoples all over the world, or in any way that your decision-making body sees fit." End quote. Four more people who were intended to be poisoned managed to survive. Grover Davis, who's 79, who was hearing impaired, missed the announcement to assemble on the loudspeaker, laid down in a ditch, and pretended to be dead. Um, Hy Hyacinth Thrash, who was 76, realized what was happening and crawled under her bed only to walk out after the suicides were completed. The only medical doctor to initially examine the scene at Georgetown was Mutu, who visually examined over 200 bodies and later told a Guyanese coroner's jury to have seen needle marks on at least 70. However, no determination was made as to whether those injections initiated initiated the introduction of poison or whether there were so-called relief injections to quicken death and reduce suffering from convulsions from those who had previously taken poison orally. Mutu and American pathologist Lynn Crook determined that cyanide was present in some bodies while analysis of the contents of the vat revealed several tran tran tranquilizers as well as potassium cyanide and potassium chloride. Plastic cups, flavored aid packets, and syringes, some with needles and some without, lifted the area or littered the area where the bodies were found. Mutu concluded that a gunshot wound to Annie Moore could have been self-inflicted, though Moore had also ingested a lethal dose of cyanide. So that is all about the most famous mass suicide. Just researching this and talking about this just makes me really sad for the people who, um, were in this they didn't want to be some did but some were just you know blinded by what they thought was you know their place and it breaks my heart for all of them that were involved I hope you like wa uh, watching this video um I love doing these kind of videos um but I also love makeup videos so this is kind of fun and different for me so if you like this video please give it a thumbs up comment down below if you want me to cover anything else and I hope you subscribe and thank you so much for watching I will see you guys next time bye guys